Thank you. All right, thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, despite the content and title of my talk, I want to reassure that I'm not leaving the HIV field to become a rheumatologist. Um, I'm not actually going to say HIV even probably once during this talk, but I think uh, this serves as a model for us to understand, as, as Georgia said, the genetics of the immune responses and immune system. And a lot of what, we'll, what I'll show you today can be used uh, directly to understand what's going on in HIV, I think, over the long term. So this whole project came about from a long-standing interest that I have uh, dealing with homeostasis uh, in, in the blood, in particular of the immune system. And specifically, how does the body count and regulate cells? And this comes from a lot of the work that was done uh, that I read about in, in the 1990s when the, uh, there was work trying to define what was offsetting the CD4 decline, where was CD8 cells going up, was it total T cells, was it an expansion of particular memory subsets or so on. And we did a lot of work to understand the regulation of the different subsets that were declining in the face of HIV infection destroying memory CD4 cells, yet we saw other compartments that were also affected. So it's a long-standing interest that I've had to, to try to understand this, but until recently, I didn't have the tools or the, the cohorts to, to access that uh, kind of information. So I'm going to tell you now about a study that, uh, that we began about four years ago as a collaboration with a group at the University of King's College in London. So when you look at the peripheral blood, and, and we're just going to talk about blood today, there's a wide variety of different leukocyte subsets. Uh, many different lineages, and, and for example, the T cells, which is one of my favorite lineages, has a lot of diversity within it, not just CD4 and CD8 cells, but there are NKT and mates and double negatives and gamma delta cells. And then within each of these, you can have sub-lineages. So within the CD4 compartment, there are described sub-lineages that, are, uh, that are, uh, uh, have different functionalities, Th1, Th2, and, and so on and so forth. And then you have to layer on top of each of those lineages a progressive differentiation that all of the leukocyte subsets have, going from naive cells to uh, early differentiated memory cells to central memory cells, for example, in the T-cell compartment, effector, and, and so on. So what you end up with is a, is a really diverse set of different cell populations in the peripheral blood, many different lineages, many different differentiation stages. And the, the system, your body has to manage all of these to maintain relatively constant or, or equal numbers uh, over time and, and over across uh, people in order to maintain a balance in the immune response as you encounter new an uh, antigens or, or previously encountered antigens. So the immune system maintains homeostasis, homeostasis in, in blood and, and in tissues in order to maintain a balance of lineages. So for example, if you count CD4 and CD8 cells in healthy adults, generally that ratio, as we know, is about two to one. It varies, it, changes, it ranges from maybe one to three or four to one, but generally it's quite, quite uh, well conserved, and certainly within a single individual, it's well conserved over time. The immune system wants to maintain a, a balance of, uh, for example, naive versus memory cells. So in general, healthy adults, about half of your T cells are naive and about half are memory. This is so that you have a, a good representation of cells against those antigens that you've previously seen, your memory responses, but you still maintain a good number of cells that can respond to antigens that you haven't seen, the naive cells. So the system wants to maintain that balance so that you can generate both kinds of responses. And then you have different, uh, different differentiation stages like central memory cells, uh, factor memory cells, and so on, and all of those may or may not be regulated. Now, the mechanisms that regulate these balances, the mechanisms by which the body counts cells, are poorly, if at all, known. And what's important here is that a dysregulation in those counting mechanisms, and dysregulation in homeostasis, uh, often accompanies or even causes disease. Obviously, cancers are a dysregulation in, in the counting of a particular clone or clonal lineage of, of cells. HIV, progressive HIV disease is marked by an imbalance in the CD4, CD8 ratio. We hypothesize that we might be able to reveal some of the mechanisms that regulate the counting of these cells by quantifying the heritability of homeostasis traits by performing GWAS to identify genetic loci in healthy subjects. Now, we want to do this in healthy subjects because we want to look at the uh, presumably unperturbed immune system. We can't look at people who already have cancer where there's already dysregulation because the system has already gone awry. So we wanted to do this in healthy subjects. So we began by constructing immunophenotyping panels to try to count or address as many different compartments in the, 
uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells as we could. So we constructed seven different, about 14 color panels uh, about four years ago that addressed all the different compartments we could think about at that time. So we had one panel, for example, aimed at T-cell differentiation. So we could distinguish naive central memory, effector memory, and so on within CD4 and CD8 T-cells as well as quantifying other markers that have been associated with differentiation that we couldn't really necessarily categorize. We had a second panel that addressed T cell activation and also counted T regulatory T cells, for example. A panel that looked at CD4 lineages, TH1, TH2, and so on, using Federica Salusta's uh, chemokine receptor method for, ident for um, uh, identifying those different populations. Uh, we had one panel that was exclusively aimed at NK cells, looking at differentiation stage and their expression of activating and inhibitory Kier and Lear uh, receptors. There was a panel aimed at innate-like cells, the NKT cells, gamma delta cells, as well as qu quantifying uh, stem cells, CD34 T cells. And, then, and we had a B cell panel that differentiated all of the different isotypes, as well as differentiation stages of the B cells. And then finally, an, a panel aimed at myeloid cells, including myeloid dendritic cells, plasma, uh, plasma dendritic cells, APCs, and the monocytes themselves. So we had a lot of different markers. We could identify a lot of different populations. Uh, once we did this, we, we started running into the question of how do we analyze all of this data? Obviously, there's a lot of different possible populations, which I'm going to start referring inter interchangeably with traits. So when I refer to a trait today, it may refer to a subset, a, a percentage of, of, of the leukocytes which are that particular subset. Like we might talk about hair color or height as a, as a trait. Um, so when we're talking about uh, subsets, we can pregate them by, by looking at the predefined known or, or subsets that have been described in the literature. For example, we know that central memory cells are cells that do not express CD45RA but express CCR7 and CD28. Or T regulatory cells have this particular four uh, marker phenotype. And by going through the literature and, and our knowledge of, of what's been described functionally and phenotypically, we were able to define somewhere between 50 and 100 different what we call canonical populations for our panels. But this obviously misses many subsets because there are a lot of cells that don't, don't fit within any of these given canonical subsets. And then the other problem is what if the canonical definition, what if the liter literature definition is not right? What if it doesn't actually define what is a uh, unit of, of regulatory control in, inside the immune system? So we took a more comprehensive approach where we tried to analyze everything all at once, all possible combinations of markers uh, simultaneously, and I'll show you that in a minute. The advantage of our approach is that we won't miss anything. In other words, all of the canonical populations defined in the literature will still be encompassed within what we're doing as a subset of all those different subsets that we're looking at. The disadvantage is that it's com computationally expensive and we run into multiple comparisons problems uh, to reduce our sensitivity. So here's an example of how we do this, practically speaking, in terms of the flow cytometry. This is from, from panel one, which is aimed at, at T cells and identifying lineages of T cells. So we begin each uh, gating by identifying live cells. And then within this panel, we're going to identify CD3 positive cells and then identify CD4 cells, CD8 cells, double negative cells, and double positive cells. So those are kind of the parent lineages that we identify in the panel. Then we have eight different markers that are associated with differentiation stages that are measured on these cells at the same time. And so for what, what we did here was just to find positive versus negative. We're just going to bifurcate the population, those that do or do not express each given marker. And we have eight different markers that we can divide. And then what we're going to do is do a Boolean combination of all eight of those taken in all possible combinations. So within each of the major lineages, as I said, we measured eight different markers during, that are expressed differentially during differentiation. And we divided them into subsets based on the combinatorial expression of each of those. So subset one, for example, might be those cells that express all eight at the same time. Subset two express seven and not the eighth marker, and so on. And when you go through all the possible combinations, you're going to have two to the eight possible subsets or 256 subsets within each of the major uh, lineages. So this starts out by identifying 1,024 different possible T cell subsets within panel one. But the problem is this is a kind of an insufficient analysis, and that's because of the following. What if regulatory control is for all cells that express, a, for example, a given pair of markers irrespective of all of the other markers? 
So just hypothetically, maybe the genetic control or the way that the immune system counts cells is by counting the number of cells that are CD127 positive, CD27 positive, and it doesn't care what else they express. That's the, the unit of control. So for example, it regulates this box of cells. The problem is if we in individually enumerate each one of those individual populations and try to identify if there's a correlated expression or correlated uh, regulation, we'll miss it because we've got 64 different contributors to what is the, con the, the regulatory mechanism and you're getting too much noise in there and we're missing the total that's going on. So what we did was what we call a tri-Boolean combination. We extend this a little bit. So instead of having just the Boolean combinations, we, we then incorporate all possible combinations of those Boolean gates as well. So for example, if in a two marker system where you're mar measuring marker A and marker B, there are four different Boolean gates. There are the cells that uh, express both A and B, the cells that express neither A and B, or the, the cells that express one or the other. In the tri-Boolean combina combination gates, we also identify cells that express A irrespective of B, cells that express B irrespective of A, and so on and so forth. And so when you go through the math, what you find is that while you have two to the N Boolean combination gates, where N is the number of markers you measure, you end up with three to the N tri-Boolean uh, gates, uh, which are partially overlapping. What about other traits? So what I've talked about so far is just regulation of the number of cells, the frequency of a particular population within a, a lineage. But genetic control might be manifest at, the, at other levels, uh, for example, at the single cell phenotype level. So rather than the system counting how many cells there are, it might regulate how much of a protein a cell expresses on the cell surface. Presumably this might relate to promoter enhancer signaling whereas the number of cells in a population relates to homeostatic and differentiation mechanisms. So in addition to counting the number of cells of each phenotype, we also in evaluated the MFI or the, the intensity of expression of a protein on each of those lineages as well. So this is an example where we measure a marker and we see that the individual on the right, the mean expression of that marker is 4,500 units. The mean expression for, of that same marker on a different individual is 2,700 units. So the first, the first person's cells express twice as much as the other person's cells. So the, we asked the question whether or not that level of regulation was also heritable. So from all seven panels, we ended up with about 4,000 different Boolean combination gates and almost 80,000 different subsets that we were quantifying. And we quantified also nearly 700 MFI values. So there were 78,000 subsets, 700 protein expression patterns, for a total of about 78,700 traits that we're now going to quantify and evaluate for heritability and for regulation by genetic control elements. All right, so that's the immunology. Now, how do we, what cohorts do we use to analyze this? So we analyzed, we applied these panels on samples that have been collected from the well-described Twins UK cohort that Tim Spector set up some 20 years ago. The cohort itself comprises about 12,000 adults and was formed to study the, the heritability and genetics of diseases with higher prevalence of, among women. So the cohort is very heavily biased towards women. It's about 80% women. What we did was we got cryopreserved PBMC and analyzed them in batch in 30 experiments across a few months in two different phases. So in our, what we call our discovery phase, we analyzed samples from 497 twins in addition, 14 US controls to, to analyze for replicate and longitudinal samples for variability. All of the, that data was fully analyzed, fully statistically modeled, and all of the results were co collated from that and, and locked in before we initiated a replication phase, a completely independent replication phase using 171 twins and 16 US controls. And in the replication phase, we tested hypotheses that we derived in the, in the discovery phase. Now, all of the data that I'm going to show you is data solely for the discovery phase. But all of the results I'm going to show you were validated in the replication phase. So they've been found in the discovery phase and then independently validated in the, in the replication phase. So a total of, we had a total of uh, nearly 700 twins. We had a two to one ratio of uh, dizygotic to monozygotic, to, uh, fraternal to identical twins. 
We chose a cohort that was 100% female, nominally healthy, and 100% UK-based Caucasian. So this is a relatively homogeneous cohort. This uniform cohort gives us the best power to detect associations given the relatively small number of samples. Now in a genetics or GWAS study, it's typical to do three to 5,000 individuals. So this is, in those terms, a relatively small study. We, of course, understand that there's a price to pay, which is that we won't be able to identify any of the genetic control elements that are not polymorphic within the, the cohort that we're looking at. So those elements which have mutations or, or alleles in, in other individuals, in other uh, ethnic groups, we won't see in this, in this study itself. So what kind of correlations can we do? So we measure 80,000 different immune traits on every single one of these individuals. What can we do with that information? Well, first of all, we can correlate them to each other. So we can ask, is somebody who has a higher representation of stem cells, will they have a higher representation of recent thymic emigrants? Is there some sort of correlation with having more stem cells, meaning more hemopoiesis? Does somebody who have more CD4 naive T cells have more CD8 naive T cells? And so on and so forth. You can pose all sorts of questions that you want to ask. We can correlate them to a very limited number of clinical measures. We don't have a lot of clinical information, but we have some, inf obviously we know the age. We have some information about allergy status and, and a very small amount of other information. But by far the most power of this study is that we can correlate all 80,000 traits to the genetics because all of these individuals have had uh, undergone the half million SNP uh, typing. The problem is if you do a GWAS on all 80,000 traits, you rapidly find that it's computationally expensive and it would have taken us uh, one to two years of supercomputer time when we started this a few years ago. And the other problem is you, this then requires a prohibitive multiple comparisons adjustment because you're comparing 80,000 traits against half a million SNPs and trying to find correlations within that. Your p-values are going to have to be 10 to the minus 20 before you start believing them. But we had the advantage in that we did this study on twins. And so we can down-select the traits that we subject to GWAS based on their heritability, which we can define independently. So how do we do that? This is the power of a twin study, is that you can identify traits that are likely heritable by looking at the correlation be between the trait of the traits between dizygotic and monozygotic twins. So this is an example looking at the fraction of CD4 cells that, are, that express CD39 for dizygotic twins. And what you can see is that if you plot one twin's CD39 percentage versus another twin, the, the, the cognate twin's CD39 percentage, you see a mild correlation with an R value of 0.4, suggesting that if one twin has more CD4 cells that express CD39, the other twin will also have more cells that express CD39 on their CD4 cells, suggesting that there is either a genetic element that's driving that or some common environmental influence, that they grew up in the same household and have the same diet and have the, were exposed to the same pathogens at roughly the same time and, and so on and so forth. So that's dizygotic twins. Now, if there's no genetic component, then this graphic would look exactly the same for the monozygotic twins. You would have the same degree of correlation because they grew up in the same household and they had the same common environmental influence. But when you look at this for monozygotic twins, what you see is that the correlation becomes much better. So here, one twin's CD39 percentage almost completely predicts the other twin's CD39 percentage with an R value of 0.93. And there's a very simple formula called Falconer's formula, which is simply twice the difference between the R values that you can use to estimate how heritable it is. And in this case, it's, it comes out to be essentially 100% heritable. You can do more uh, sophisticated structure equation modeling and come out with a heritability of about 90%, suggesting that the number of CD4 cells that express CD39 is almost completely genetically controlled. So this is how we down-selected traits. We, we did the structured equation modeling and the Falconer's formula on all 80,000 traits, took the top 150 independent traits, and then subjected those to GWAS analysis, rather than starting by subjecting all 80,000 to GWAS analysis. And we pay a, a multiple comparisons price that is two to three logs lower by doing that uh, filtering. Now, when we're analyzing this data, we can do a discovery in, in both directions. 
So as I, as I said, we used heritability analysis to identify likely traits to subject to GWAS analysis. In other words, given trait X, which of the half million SNPs across the genome are associated with variation in the expression of trait X? That's pretty straightforward, and that's what I just showed you. And hopefully we identify some SNP Z, or some location in the chromosome, some gene, that, that shows evidence for association with the variability in that trait. And that provides a hypothesis for studying the mechanism by which that locus controls the expression of trait X. But we have another step we can do where we can reverse the analysis. We can start with SNP Z and ask which of the other 80,000 traits are also associated with its alleles. And we can do this in a somewhat relaxed statistical, with a somewhat relaxed statistical penalty because we might be able to identify additional traits A, B, and C that share regulatory mechanisms with the original trait X and or provide insight into the control mechanisms. And I'm going to show you examples of, of how we went through this and, and the kinds of insights that we can gain from this, these approaches. So we were able to preserve highly conservative significant thresholds while yielding assist, additional associations by doing this two-way discovery. So to uh, uh, illustrate the power of this approach, I'm going to describe the, the data in, in three little vignettes. First of all, I'll talk about T regulatory T cells, which I alluded to, which is that the number of C39 positive T regulatory cells is heritable. Now, when we were in the process of doing this, we'd finished our discovery phase and we had begun our replication phase, an Italian group scooped us on this finding and published that, in fact, this was the case already. So that was a little bit of a downer because we already knew the result, but we weren't ready to publish it because we insisted on doing a replication phase, which they did not do. But the, the, the nice thing is we were able to identify the likely mechanism because of our additional analyses that actually has important implications for understanding Treg functions. I'll show you a very short vignette about differentiation, showing that we can identify genetic control over different differentiation stages in virtually every leukocyte compartment. And then I'll finish with what is probably the most interesting outcome of this study, which is that we were able to identify immune traits that are associated with alleles known to have increased risk of diseases like lupus or Crohn's or IBD and so on and so forth. And ask the question whether or not we can provide mechanistic insight into the etiology of these diseases. So I showed you this graph a few moments ago. C39 is a marker that has been proposed to identify T regulatory T cells. This is a finding that was made a few years ago by groups both published in the mouse and in the human, showing that CD39 positive CD4 T cells carry virtually all T regulatory function. And we were quite stunned to find that the regulation of CD39 positive cells in the peripheral blood was nearly 100% heritable. It had nothing to do with your environmental exposure or your pathogen exposure. It had to do with particular SNP in, in, your, in your genes. So we do the GWAS analysis, and we find that the regulation of the variants in CD39 maps to a single locus on chromosome 10. And in fact, that locus is the CD39 gene itself. Now this was our first flag that something additional must be going on. How is it that the gene for CD39, or that variants in the gene for CD39, could regulate the number of CD39 positive cells in the peripheral blood? How would this possibly manifest as a homeostatic mechanism? Well, the simple association is actually quite strong. So here are shown two different pairs of, of fraternal twins looking at the expression of CD39 versus CD25 on cells that have already been gated as CD45 RO positive, CD127 negative memory cells. Now, the, the phenotype that's associated with T regulatory T cells has kind of evolved over the years. In the late 1990s, when they were first described, Tregs were defined simply as CD25 very bright cells, which is a, f a very poor definition, but it was a working definition. Then later, uh, it was def they were found to be uh, well defined as CD45 RO positive, CD127 negative, and CD25 positive cells, what's shown in the shaded region there. And then as I said, there were two papers in the mouse and the human, which showed that CD39 positive cells contain virtually all of the T regulatory activity. And so a lot of research has started to be poured into understanding why CD39 positive, which is an ectodinuclease, why would that mark uh, T regulatory T cells? But what you can see is that when you look at the haplotype, 
at this one particular SNP in the CD39 locus, it really does mark a very large difference in the representation of CD39 positive cells. You can see that the people who are GG homozygous have virtually no CD39 positive cells, whereas those who are AG or AA have a very good representation of CD39 positive CD4 T cells. And in fact, if you just quantify this in a bar graph, you get a very strong association. The GGs have way depressed numbers of CD39 positive cells. The homozygote A's and the heterozygote AG's have very high levels of CD39 positive T cells. So that was an interesting finding. And here, this is the first time we did the kind of reverse analysis. We identified this SNP that was associated with the regulation of CD39 positive CD4 T cells. So we ask, OK, out of those 80,000 traits that we have in our database, what else is associated with this particular SNP? Are there other things that, that are being regulated by it? And the number one hit was, in fact, cells that have a similar phenotype but are CD39 negative, and they have exactly the opposite relationship, but in fact a much stronger association, that the GGs have the highest proportion of CD39 negative Tregs, if you will, compared to the others. So what happens is it looks like this allele controls whether cells are CD39 positive or CD39 negative. And in fact, when we quantified the expression of CD39, we began to understand exactly what was going on. So when we look at the MFI, or how much CD39 there is on the, on the cell surface, what we see is that the heterozygotes, the AG heterozygotes, have exactly half the expression of CD39, as does the AA homozygote. And the GG homozygote has none. Very simple hypothesis comes out of this, which is that the A allele expresses CD39, the G allele does not express CD39. Whether it's a promoter element or an enhancer element, we don't know, but a very simple association. And, and it's just a gene dosing effect. If you have two copies of the A, you have twice as much CD39. So here's the frequency I just showed you by, by haplotype. This is the proportion of cells that express CD39. When we look at the expression level on a per cell basis, you see a very strong dependence on the number of A alleles. And here, you can distinguish the heterozygotes from either homozygote because they express intermediate levels of CD39. So it's quite true we were able to confirm what the Italian group found, that CD39 positive Treg are under strong genetic control mapping to the CD39 gene itself. But the mechanism for this regulation is through on-off regulation of the, of the gene, the protein expression on all lymphocytes that would normally express that gene, not just CD4 cells. We showed it on other cell populations as well. So what happens is that the number of T regulatory T cells is not genetically controlled. And that's nice for the immunologists who study T regs. Only the expression of CD39 of, on T regs is genetically controlled. So it's, it, while it's true that CD39 positive T cells are Treg, it is not true that all Tregs are CD39 positive because people who are GG homozygotes don't have CD39, and yet they have perfectly good functioning T regulatory T cells. And then importantly, given the, the apparent lack of any clinical phenotype that's been associated with these alleles so far, it calls into question the importance of CD39 expression for Treg function. In other words, people are perfectly healthy whether they have 39 or not. There's no diseases that have been associated with that, that particular SNP. So it's likely that the Tregs are carrying out all their activities whether or not they express CD39. And so it makes you wonder whether or not CD39 is, is at all relevant to Treg function. Nonetheless, it is, it is interesting, and we found this to be true for both CD39 and CD73, which are both ectonucleases expressed on Tregs. Both of them show expression-based polymorphisms in human populations. So there must be a reason why these polymorphisms are maintained in, in the general population, but it may not have anything to do directly with Treg function. All right, let me talk very briefly about differentiation. We asked whether or not different differentiation stages are also heritable. And we found that, in fact, we could find examples in all of the different leukocyte subsets. So here's an example of B cells where we quantified different subsets of B cells, and we found that the percent of B cells that are immature in fact, is heritable and maps to a gene, the, the matrix metal endopeptidase gene, in, in the way that's shown here. Now, how does the MME gene impact the differentiation B cells? I have no idea. 
But it might be interesting for people who are, understand, who are studying B cell differentiation to start considering the role of this MMA gene in terms of the functionality that might lead to these different differentiation stages and understand that. It's also interesting to consider whether or not there's different ability of people to respond to B cell antigens or immunogens based on this haplotype because they have different proportions of immature B cells in the blood compared to mature B cells. Within CD4 T cells, we found that the percentage that are TH22-like is regulated by a mitochondrial protein encoded by the genomic, the DNA, the normal uh, cellular DNA, the SPG7 protein. How does this work? I don't know. But again, if you're looking at TH22, you might want to consider dividing up your uh, patient cohort by this particular SNP. And then an interesting example within NK cells, we found that there was one, when we look at the expression of CD335 and CD314, we found that one of the four subsets defined by those two markers was extremely highly heritable, heritability of 65%, but the others are not. So somehow the system is regulating the cells that have one very particular phenotype, but doesn't care necessarily about the other subsets. And that mapped to a single uh, locus again, the KLRC4 gene, and that controls the regulation of how many of those particular cells in the A population is. We found examples in T cell differentiation where the, the proportion of the earliest memory population, the stem cell memory cells, mapped to the FAST gene, that people who had a particular haplotype of FAST had more or less stem cell memory cells and might have more or less ability to maintain uh, long-term memory responses. We found a particular subset of transitional memory cells which showed a very high degree of heritability, but we could not map this to a genetic locus, did not come up in the, as a GWAS hit. And so that suggests that either it's a very polymorphic locus and we don't have the power to detect it, or it's multigenic. But again, the number of transitional memory cells is well-regulated genetically for some reason that we don't understand. So genetic control is evident across multiple stages in all lineages. But at this point, we've only had identified a few of the genetic loci that control these. And that may be because it's a relatively small study. It may be that the loci are highly polymorphic, even in our relatively uniform cohort. And it might be because there's multigenic control. But what is interesting is that particular subsets within each of the lineages of, of lymphocytes do show unusually high genetic control. And so that begs the question whether or not these are functionally unique What's important about this? Why is it that the immune system regulates those, those cells so critically compared to other cell populations? All right, and let me finish now with the autoimmunity vignette. So as I said, we identify immune traits that are associated with alleles known to have increased risk of disease. So we looked at our myeloid populations in as much detail as we could at the time understand when you look at dendritic cells, you can divide them into multiple different populations. You have the plasmacytoid dendritic cells, which express 123 and not CD11C. You have the myeloid dendritic cells, which express CD11C but not CD123. And within myeloid dendritic cells, you have professional APCs for CD8, you have professional APCs for CD4, and you have this inflammatory myeloid dendritic cell population that expresses CD16. And then there's another major population of dendritic cells this CD11C, CD123 double positive population that none of the DC biologists can tell me what they do, but they're quite prevalent in the, in the peripheral blood. The story I'm going to tell you focuses in on the inflammatory myeloid dendritic cells, the IMDCs. So what we found was that when we looked at the expression of CD32 on IMDCs, it was extraordinarily highly regulated and heritable, with a heritability that approached 100%. You can see how the monozygotic twins line up almost exclusively on the diagonal. The dizygotic twins are scattered all over the place. And in fact, it almost looks like you have on-off regulation where some, one twin expresses, the other does not. Both twins express or both twins do not. But it's not quite on or off because you still have quite a few people who are scattered around in the middle. But there is a, a certain degree of that. When we mapped it to the, by GWAS, we, we found that in fact it mapped to a single gene on chromosome one, a single locus. And that locus was, in fact, the locus around the CD32 gene itself, the FCR gamma 2 A locus. Now, this is an incredibly interesting locus with some very well-known, well-described uh, SNPs. And I'm going to talk about two of those SNPs right now. One, the RS180-1274 in red, that is actually a coding SNP. 
So that alleles in that SNP encode for two different forms of the CD32 receptor. And I'll talk about another SNP, RS108, which is actually in the five prime promoter enhancer region for the CD32 gene. Now, this locus has long been known in the autoimmunity field. As I said, the, the coding SNP encodes two different variants of the SCR gamma 2A form, what's, what are called the R form and the H forms of CD32. What's known is that the R form has very low or negative binding for IgG2 and IgG3, whereas the H form has very high affinity for those immunoglobulins and presumably mediates immune uh, complex mediated inflammation much better than the R form. In contrast, the R form has very high affinity for CRP and the H form has very low affinity for CRP. The R form has been associated with a variety of diseases, uh, uh, susceptibilities, for example, HIV progression, susceptibility to malaria disease, but it's best known for its association with, as a risk factor for lupus and uh, uh, um, Guillain-Barre, multiple sclerosis, Graves, and type 1 diabetes. On the other hand, the H form predisposes individuals to ulcerative colitis, Kawasaki's, and, and more recently, severe pneumonia that's associated with influenza. So when we look at the CD32 expression on, lymph on leukocyte populations, what we see is a very restricted regulation of the CD32 expression. So on the bottom is shown CD32 on B cells. On the top is CD32 on the inflammatory myeloid dendritic cells, again, for two different pairs of dizygotic twins. And what you can see is that there's absolutely, on the B cells, there's absolutely no dependence on this locus for the expression of CD32. So all the B cells and all the individuals express the same amount of CD32 per cell, and they, all the B cells express CD32. Whereas, as you see in the top, the expression on myeloid dendritic cells on IMDCs was highly dependent on the genotype at this one particular locus. So this is not some sort of global recognition problem. This isn't a problem with a, uh, a, a SNP in an epitope that renders our antibody in, unable to see it or unable, the cells unable to express it because they do it just fine on B cells. It's only on inflammatory myeloid dendritic cells that they can't express it. So that starts to beg the question, how can a coding SNP how can a, 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 a little polymorphism in the exon of a gene affect the ability to express that gene only on one particular subset of cells? But the fact is there's a very strong regulation that is associated with RS180, 1274, or some SNP in linkage disequilibrium with that SNP, where you can see that the individuals who are CC homozygous generally have very low expression of CD32, and the individuals with the TT generally have high or intermediate expression of CD32. But it's a little unsatisfying because there's still exceptions. There's quite a few people who are CC who express a lot of CD32. There's people who are TT who do not express CD32. So there are additional elements, control elements involved. So that's the data I just showed you. Now, one of our collaborators had found that another SNP that's only six kilobases away has been independently associated with SLE. So we asked whether or not that independently associated SNP also had any impact on CD32 expression. And the answer is yes, but in a very strange way. So these are the distributions for CD32 expression by this RS108 SNP. And what you can see is that the GG homozygotes either express or they don't. The AA homozygotes express, but at intermediate levels. So it's not an on-off question, it's a, it's, it's, a very, it's a much more complicated kind of regulation question. And we had no idea what was going on until by just random luck, we happened to look at both of these SNPs simultaneously, and suddenly the picture started coming into focus. That when you look at the combination of the allelotypes of both of these SNPs, the diplotype, you see almost a complete, but not complete, but almost complete prediction of the expression of CD32 on inflammatory myeloid dendritic cells. So here's the data I just showed you, the six diplotypes that were present in our population, expression of CD32 on, on IMDCs. I'm not gonna show that in a compressed format here, just showing you this compressed bar graph by the, the diplotypes in order to show you what that relationship is on other populations in the myeloid compartment. First of all, on the far left is monocytes. They show the same kind of regulation with a smaller dynamic range. 
Then PDCs and the, the APCs for CD8s on the far right, neither of those populations express CD32 at all. Then when you look in the middle at the, for example, the CD11C, CD123 positive population, these cells are very much like the regulation we saw on B cells, which is that it's completely independent of this locus. Doesn't matter what the diplotype is. They always express it to the same amount. So they use other transcription and, and control elements to express the CD32. And the IMDCs show the best dynamic range, and then other populations show you similar kinds of expression. Now, we found a powerful association between the CD32 locus alleles and expression of CD32 on myeloid cells, particularly inflammatory cells. But some of the autoimmune diseases that have been associated with this locus are T-cell mediated, like type 1 diabetes and Crohn's. These are not diseases of immune complexes, these are T-cells. So how is it that a T-cell phenotype or etiology might arise from a locus that has probably very little to do directly with T-cells? So we again ask the reverse question. We have this locus. Are there other phenotypes that are dysregulated or, or that are controlled by this locus? In particular, are there any in the T-cells? So again, we correlated all immune traits against these particular SNPs and ask if the diplotype affected uh, anything else, or the monotype. And we found that the answer was yes. And this is just one example. There are others in the paper. This is looking at the amount of expression of CD27, which is a co-receptor, co-stimulatory molecule on T cells. It's in the TNF receptor family. The amount of CD27 per cell separated out by these different RS180 genotypes. Now, the CD27 gene itself is on a completely different chromosome than chromosome 1. It's unlinked to this. So this is a trans effect. This is not a shared promoter or shared enhancer. This is a completely independent effect. What might be going on? Well, people who have high expression of CD32 on, mono on the monocytes might have a different tonic uh, level of inflammation. They might have a higher kind of basal inflammation level which leads to higher expression of CD27 on the T cells. And people with the other haplotype have a lower tonic inflammation and express lower CD27. So it might be some sort of secondary uh, regulatory phenomenon that the kind of the tonic level of stimulation leads to this alteration in CD27. But the, the point is, this altered level of CD27 might be the predictor for susceptibility to these T cell mediated diseases. And so I would hypothesize, for example, that we should look at a cohort of, of subjects and divide them by high and low CD27 expression and ask whether that better predicts type 1 diabetes or Crohn's or Kawasaki's than does the, the, the RS180 genotype. Clearly, RS180 genotype affects CD27, but maybe CD27 expression is the primary mechanism or etiology for these diseases. We don't know, but certainly this opens up that possibility. So we found a powerful association between the CD32 locus alleles and expression of CD32 on myeloid cells. We also found powerful associations between this locus and lymphocyte subsets, including CD27 expression on T cells. I think this leads to new avenues of research in autoimmunity. Specifically, what is the role of these immune traits, CD32 expression or CD27 expression? What is the role of those immune traits in disease? And maybe the coding SNP. All of the research right now in the lupus field, or almost all of it that's related to this SNP, is asking why is it that the high avidity form and the low avidity form have differential susceptibility to disease? Maybe that's not it at all. Maybe it's just that that coding SNP is in linkage disequilibrium with the promoter enhancer element that turns on and off CD32 on inflammatory myelodendritic cells. And it's that expression which is the primary mechanism and etiology of, of the autoimmune disease. And in fact, maybe the coding SNP is a compensatory mutation. Maybe that the people who don't express CD32 on inflammatory myelodendritic cells have to have the low avidity CRP, otherwise they have too much inflammation. Maybe the people who have high expression of CD32 have to have the low, I'm sorry, the low avidity form in order to turn, tune down that inflammation. So maybe it's a compensatory mutation for the actual mechanism that's associated with the disease etiology. So our study of the immune system in healthy adults revealed many genetic loci that are associated with variations in homeostatic levels and phenotypes of different leukocyte populations. 
I think these, disease, these associations will reveal mechanisms of homeostasis, how the body counts cells in the blood. And further, when those go awry with dysregulation, may reveal mechanisms of disease and immunopathogenesis and give us a better understanding of what's going wrong in people who are sick. And our approach and our data set, even though it's on exclusively healthy people, provide a valuable resource to the study of disease. And all of our data is publicly available. You can download it, and you can look at these associations yourself, and you can ask those kinds of questions. So I think we're able to accelerate by this mechanism, by this method, the discovery of disease mechanisms. Now, historically, in order to understand disease mechanisms or etiology, we started with, by doing a natural history study of disease and identifying from a large population those people who had a disease and those people who control population who did not have a disease. And you do a very large scale GWAS on 3,000 or 5,000 individuals. And if you're lucky, you identify a locus, locus Z, that predicts susceptibility to the disease. But the question is, now what do you do? You have to ask the question, what is the role of locus Z in this particular disease? The problem with that is locus Z often will have a dozen or more genes because we're only able to tie it down to a few hundred kilobases. The other problem is that usually the association is very weak. The odds ratio is three is a good odds ratio for some of these genetic associations. And there are complex pathways. Even if you identify one gene, that gene may have many different uh, mechanisms. But what we can do now is hone in on what the mechanism might be. So what we can do now is correlate locus Z against the 80,000 traits that we have in our database. And hopefully, you'll be able to identify some trait X, some immune trait, population or phenotype or whatever, that associates with locus Z. And what that does is it provides you with a new hypothesis that the disease mechanism involves immune trait X. And you stop worrying about this GWAS study and that particular locus, and now focus in on the functionality. You know which subset of cells to start evaluating. You know which gene to start evaluating. And it allows you to create better mouse models and focus in your, your study on what is likely the most more proximal mechanism here. So I want to acknowledge the people who have really carried out and done this study. This is an immense amount of work that was primarily done, the, the staining and, and uh, uh, of all the samples was done by Maggie in my laboratory. Yolanda and Pratip uh, helped develop the original panels that were so key to this. And this was a collaboration that uh, we did with Frank Nestle and Tim Spector at King's College in London, uh, who maintained the cohort and processed all, processed all the original specimens and sent them to us. All of this data was published in, uh, earlier this year in Cell. It's a very dense paper, but uh, it has all of the information that I talked about. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mario. Um, but can, I, can I press you to mention the HIV word again? And HIV. <laughs> Some of these findings, so how would you advise, or how had this made you think differently about looking at the induction of broadly neutralizing antibodies in people and how either that mechanism happens in some people in relation to autoimmunity or how that may help us um, induce that in a vaccine regimen? Yeah, so I can't address that directly, but what I can do is address it indirectly in the following way. So if you can do a GWAS to identify loci that are likely associated with people who develop broadly neutralizing antibodies. So you do, you do a large enough study and say, people who develop BNAPs have something associated with chromosome X position Y. We can go into our system and say, that locus happens to control the number of B cells that are in the peripheral blood, or control the differentiation from immature to mature, or something like that, and, and helps you uh, start thinking about what the mechanism to look forward is beyond just that one association. Because as I said, some of these associations are very strange. So we found controlling immature B cells was the MME gene. To my knowledge, the MME gene has virtually nothing to do with immune functions. So if, we, if you were to map BNABs to the MME gene, you would have nowhere to, to turn to, to say, what are we going to do? How do we understand that? But our database provides a link and says, so for some reason, that gene also controls the proportion of, of, naive, of immature B cells. And that is the kind of link that makes sense to us biologically, whereas just knowing the locus didn't help really with that.
against particular diseases? I mean, Predict drug sensi sensitivity? If, yes. Again, not, not, you can't a priori go into this database and do that. But what you can do, again, is if you have a genetic locus that you've identified as being correlated with that, it helps you identify the mechanism or accelerate discovery of that mechanism. But yeah, you, right. the prediction this, directly from this database is, won't, won't help you, right? So are you doing this now? Are you working with drug companies? Or, no. And do you expect to work with drug companies, or is this something more I expect more them to download our database and do it themselves, <laughs> <laughs> rather than telling me what they're doing. Celia? So this may be really naive. Is, is twins, having twins, heritable? And if so, it, are any of the twins, how many of the twins in your small population from a small part of the world yeah. related? Yeah. And does that affect the, the applicability, the global applicability of these data? So from what I understand, there's a small element of, of heritability in twinning that uh, and, and it travels through the female. Um, but it's not, not a very strong association, but there is an association. Um, as far as I know, none of our twins are related to other twin pairs. Uh, they're all roughly in the same age range, so they can't be maternally uh, related. They would have to be siblings. Um, but I'm, I'm almost positive that my collaborators would have taken those out of consideration. But, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, turn it over. Thank you, Mario.